I'm not on mic or camera. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, the MENA Theater Makers Alliance virtual convening. My name is Catherine Corey. Uh, I'm with you from Upper Manhattan, land of the Lenape people. And uh, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Minatma. Um, the MENA Theater Makers Alliance amplifies the voices of Middle Eastern and North African theater makers and expands how stories from and about our communities are told on U.S. stages. We take space, make opportunities, champion artists, and build relationships with other marginalized communities and allies to build a more vibrant American theater. Um, I want to take a moment to just go over um, what uh, is happening with the convening today. Um, after this panel, uh, there will be a panel um, moderated by Malik Najjar um, at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1230 um, Eastern time followed by a 1.30 Pacific time panel called Beyond the Proscenium um, that will be moderated by Tracy Francis. And then later on, of course, open mic, uh, which uh, I hope that you'll participate in. Um, so um, I just wanna note that this panel is being streamed via HowlRound. Thank you, HowlRound. And also on the Golden Threads Facebook page. Uh, just so you know, and then I guess it's okay if I just move on and introduce the panelists for today. It's my great pleasure to introduce four of the writers I most admire uh, who join me here in conversation. Muna Mansur, Heather Raffo, Betty Shamia, and Sanaz Tusi. Mina women playwrights on U.S. stages. Hi, everybody. There you are. Beautiful. Um, Listen, by way of introduction, I'm going to just excerpt a little bit from their bios. Their full bios can be found in the chat. Um, so I'll start with Muna. Award-winning playwright Muna Mansour is the author of the Vagrant Trilogy, which will make its New York City debut in April 2022 at the Public Theater, directed by Mark Wing Davy. Her play Unseen will have its West Coast debut at Oregon Shakespeare Festival in spring 2022, directed by Evan O'Chicken. Uh, we Swim, We Talk, We Go to War premiered at San Francisco's Golden Thread in 2018. The Vagrant Trilogy was presented at Mosaic Theater in June of 18, directed by Mark Wing Davy. And a play of the trilogy, The Hour of Feeling, premiered at the Humana Festival in Actors Theater of Louisville, and an Arabic translation was presented at NYU Abu Dhabi in 2016 and in Beirut in 2018 as part of, part of the Arab Voices Project. Mona also writes for New Amsterdam and is working on a script for AMC International. Heather Raffo is an award-winning playwright and actress whose work has taken her from the Kennedy Center to the U.S. Islamic World Forum in Qatar and from London's House of Lords to classrooms nationally and internationally. Raffo's libretto for the opera Fallujah, the first opera about the Iraq War, and the first to openly confront the alarming rates of veteran suicide was part of Kennedy Center's International Theater Festival, received its world premiere at Long Beach Opera and opened at New York City Opera in 2016. She's the author and performer of Noura, which premiered in DC before moving to Abu Dhabi, Cairo, New York City, and theaters across the nation. And Nine Parts of Desire, which ran off Broadway for nine months and has played across US and internationally for two decades. Heather is currently preparing a film adaptation of Nine Parts of Desire, directed by Mike Mosalem. Betty Shamia is the author of 15 plays. Her theater productions include The Black Eyed at New York Theater Workshop, Territories, uh, Fit for a Queen at the Classical Theater of Harlem and Roar with the new group. A New York Times critic pick, critics pick, Roar was the first play about a Palestinian American family produced off Broadway and is widely taught at universities across the country. Shamia is developing a new screenplay as soon as possible based on her play that was commissioned by Second Stage and Time Warner and she was commissioned through New Theater's Artist Advancing Cultural Change Program to write a comic television pilot inspired by Roar. 
Tremia was recently named the Mellon Foundation Playwright in Residence at the Classical Theater of Harlem and a visiting artist at Stanford. Sanaz Kusi is an Iranian-American playwright from Orange County, California. Her plays include Wish You Were Here, which was produced as a Williams, Williamstown Audible in 2020 and will premiere at Playwrights Horizons in 2022, and English, which will have its premiere at Atlantic in 2022. She's currently under commission at the Atlantic, Williamstown Theater Festival, Manhattan Theater Club, South Coast Repertory, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Sanaz is a member of Youngblood and the Middle Eastern American Writers Lab at the Lark and is an alum of Club Thumb's Early Career Writers Group. She was a 2019 P73 Playwriting Fellow and a recipient of the 2020 Steinberg Playwright Award. Thank you for joining us today, everybody. I'm so pleased to be in conversation with you. Um, you know, I, I wrote to all of you and talked a little bit about kind of the topics that I would love to cover. And I, I just want to, um, I'm just changing the view here to gallery. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Hi. Oh, look how beautiful you all are. Okay. So, um, <laughs> um, I said, you know, earlier that I wanted to talk with you about, you know, the issues of inspiration, collaboration, adaptation, representation, and controversy, which I imagine all of you have encountered at one time or another. But I want to start with inspiration and ask you maybe to talk a little bit about what got you started as a playwright and what got you started telling the kind of stories that you're telling and opening up um, the stories uh, of our community in the ways that you have. What prompted you, for example, to use playwriting as your medium, Betty Shamia? <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine a panel like this coming out of graduate school in playwriting. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how many years ago, but a minute ago. So it's just fantastic to be, you know, on a panel with such diverse writers. Um, uh, I guess I'm just a deeply social person and I, um, I came out of an activist background. And, you know, when I got out of school, there was no internet essentially. So I had two kind of lives, one as a playwright and one as an activist. And you could kind of be a very um, forward person in the activist community and not be like identified as, um, you know, a Palestinian in your work. Uh, so for me, the thing that attracted me to theater was I, I was deeply, deeply interested in being with other people and I couldn't go off and write a novel at that point. Um, uh, so I think we're having a little bit of technical issues. Um, uh, so, but what that's are you experiencing, the thing. I, Betty? I'm I'm hearing somebody, but whatever, fine. It's Zoom, yay. Uh, but basically, I'm I, you know, I I was doing it in the hopes that there would be panels like this, where where I wouldn't feel like the only Arab or Palestinian or Middle Eastern person in the world. And um, and now that the community has kind of grown and there's all these diverse voices. I just am so excited because, you know, I very much identify as a person of color and, you know, I'm in residence at a predominantly African-American theater company. I really uh, believe in the interchange of, of communities of color, you know, banding together, but it's also nice to see the growth of this community. So I created and create theater because I want people to hang out with me and, you know, when you cast them in your plays, they do. So. I mean, yeah, I, I certainly can relate to that. I think that, you know, my first community was, you know, in grade school doing plays. So I, I, those are the people I related to. And it's never ended. It's never stopped. Mona, how about you? How did you get started writing plays and telling these stories? Uh, excuse me. I haven't spoken yet much today. Uh, that's terrible. Good morning, everyone on the East and West Coast. Um, and I ditto what you're saying, Betty. Um, so happy to just see all your faces and hear about the amazing shit everybody's up to. It's really something. Uh, I started as an actor also and really wanted to be like a great actress of the American theater, a la 
name the person, you know, Meryl Streep. I mean, one of these, I didn't think I was Meryl Streep, but I was like, that's the kind of career I want, classical theater, American, contemporary. Um, but it didn't quite, I kind of wasn't that good and I didn't really, um, I got pulled into doing improv at some point and then I kind of went down the comedy path for a while and I was doing like the Sunday Company, you know, the, the Groundlings and, um, and then in that form, that's where I started to write uh, was sketch and, and that, that notion of having a gun to your head um, <laughs> where you just gotta, you gotta have a, you gotta create. And then I started to get frustrated. I was like, why can't a scene be 10 minutes long? Um, and from there I wrote sort of out of that experience and then not getting in the ground. <laughs> uh, I ended up writing a, kind of the, yeah, my first play, which was called Me in the SLA. And it was about my fascination with Patricia Hearst. And it wove in things about identity because the SLA also stands for the Southern, Southern Lebanese Army. And it, it sort of came around to this thing of, I, I thought I was the heiress and it's like, no girl, you're not, that's not you. You're, you're one of the other people in this story your people are the terrorists in this story. And it's so doing that, it, I sort of never, I mean, I, I performed that show, but I think I knew that I would not be a Heather Raffo and be able to do that. I think that Heather's exceptional in that way, um, in many ways, but I think soon after that, I just didn't need to act anymore. So that's kind of how that happened. It wasn't, it was very zigzaggy. I didn't do grad school, I wouldn't have minded. But then the, the one other thing I'll say is that um, I felt very fortunate when I got chosen to be in the Emerging Writers Group at the Public Theater um, because it was sort of a couple years into me saying to myself, I'm just going to be a writer. And it just it gave me a whole different sense of what it was to be a playwright. And everyone in the group in my year had very different styles and backgrounds um so and i guess the reason i do it or continue to do it is that i'm just endlessly fascinated with and bewildered by human behavior <laughs> yeah uh, that's a quotable quote absolutely <laughs> definitely sanaz how did you get started um really i just i i, I want to know um yeah, I, it's so funny, Betty, hearing you say like you started, you know, t with this urge to like hang out with people. I think, I think my, um, the start of my playwriting was much more uh, inward. I think I was really, um, I mean, I wrote like poetry and I've loved music all my life and I'm Iranian, so we all we all feel like we are born poets. <laughs> but um, I was really lost when I uh, left college. I was working at a pizza shop. I'd like I, I was as lost as like a, a woman in her early twenties could be. And I was a dumb theater kid in high school, which is a, a I, I wear that badge with with honor. I was just like an absurd dork dorky theater kid and. You know, when I graduated college, I was so lost. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I had had like a failed first year in New York. I like tried to move here when I was 23 and like totally like got my ass kicked by the city. Um, and I went, uh, you know, I went back home with like my tail in between my legs. I'm from, I'm from Orange County. And then I went to uh, Iran that summer and I had been going back and forth my whole life but hadn't been in sort of a, a, a while um and I think you know before I made that trip to Iran I'd written like you know a few plays that you know I read them now I like you know someone would have to like pull me off the ledge of a building but um when I went to Iran that summer it was the first time it had occurred to me that I could sort of write about myself and I could write about who I was and like what I really struggled with, which has I think been 
had an identity crisis all my life between my Americanness and my Iranianness, and I know that's like not that is not unique to me. So I would really like say that summer, as I was surrounded by my you know Iranian family, and we don't have a lot of our Iranian family here in the states. I really was like. I don't know, I had this urge to like vomit out that feeling onto a page. So I don't know that I can, ha I have like a real like answer to it, but I feel like that is the moment I actually became a playwright and the moment I thought like, you know, I had like that, <laughs> that bold uh, instinct that I think everyone kind of has in this industry, which is like, wow, I, I really feel an urge to write about this. Maybe I should even share this with people. Like what would happen if I shared this with people? Um, yeah, that's how I, how I came to it. Yeah, you know, I'm struck by the, the thread of coming up against uh, one's differentness and that becoming a, a really strong motivator in terms of storytelling. Um, that do you know what I mean? There's a moment in that um, of realizing that you're different from the people around you, and it's a subtle difference in this case, but it's it's very real. Heather, um, when you were growing up in Michigan, um, did you come up against those things? And did that influence your desire to write? Did you start as an actor? Just talk to me. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I mean, my. Yes, I grew up in Michigan. Yes, I started as an actor and am an actor. Um, and, and yes, that was my only intended career. As in, I didn't, I did get a literature degree, but I didn't take playwriting classes and never ever thought I was capable. Um, but I did always want to be an actor. And my undergrad, I would say I was like Fornes and Intezake Shange were everything to my influences. And then where I landed was like, oh, but I can't be in those plays, right? So where am I, where, where will I ever get to be in community with that if I'm not from those communities, right? But those, those plays really spoke to me and all my study after undergrad was in Shakespeare. So Shakespeare was a huge influence. So that, that idea of classical training and that kind of epic mythic characters was, you know, and poetry, just constant, constant poetry and language in my mouth all the time. And, you know, how that lives on stage is, is, clearly come around in my work. I can see that now. But, but what made me start writing um, was, really, was really the pull between, um, I don't see, it's, I don't see any characters on stage as protagonists that are about the things that I wanna be about, right? But even more specific than that, we'd already had one war with Iraq. And by the time I was in grad school in 98, right? That was like a half decade later. And we still didn't have these voices on stage. So it was really like a hot fire underneath me that we were still bombing that country. We were still deeply wedded and embedded in that country and nobody seemed to care. So I, like Sanaz, had had a pretty definitive, I had a definitive trip to Iraq when I was 23. So by the time I was 29, I finally started writing about it. Um, and then the fire got lit even further when 9-11 happened. Even in 2000, I remember being on the phone with my dad saying, we're gonna to go to war in Iraq again. Bush was just elected, it was election night. I'm like, here we go again, this can't happen again. So I just wanted to do something about it. And for some reason, I thought the theater was the place to do it. Like, I really think about that specifically of like why, 
what in my activist nature thought that would be the best plan? No, honestly, as opposed to what would I do in DC or how would I, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember, I mean, you kind of poked fun about that nine month run. And yes, it was exhausting, you know, eight shows <laughs> a week for nine months in the middle of a war, right? That was, that's, you know, there was, and there wasn't much care for like what's actually going on in one's personal life with family in Iraq. But, but what's very interesting about that process was the um, Iraqi ambassador to the UN at the time, he became the Iraqi ambassador to the United States was like, you can do in an hour what it's taken me a lifetime to do. And I do think we all feel that way in the theater. Like we get, we get that distilled 90 minute, two hour window of impact that can rearrange people in a kind of a particular way, right? And I'm not saying it's the reason to do it or we have to, you know, it's just, it's interesting that it, it, it can work out like that. And yeah. so I think that's why I kept doing it because the, the, the number of struggles around it have been exhausting and um, heartbreaking. But that sense of like, oh, but this one thing is working. And it, it's, yes, it worked on in New York, but more importantly, it worked in North Carolina and it worked in a high school in Denver, right? And then you go, oh, I like, I like this conversation quite a bit. Definitely, definitely. And by the way, I wasn't poking fun at the nine months run. I'm just simply blown away that you did that, okay? I just want to be clear about that. Um, and this, what you just said reminded me of a conversation. I brought uh, Ismail Halidi and his father, Rashid Halidi, together in conversation once. And they started out by saying, he started out by saying, I could write 10 books and I would not make, I would not reach as many people as Ismail reaches in a week with his show. In other words, he was getting the word out. He was telling the stories. The people were so real on the stage. He felt that, the, or she felt that the medium of theater was the most influential. Um, I, I'm wondering too about along the way, as you've been working, uh, all of you, who your collaborators have been, who have um, encouraged you, lifted you up, challenged you, messed with you, so that it, it made you go to the next step in terms of what you were writing and what you thought needed to be written. Any thoughts about that, Betty? Um, yeah. I love this question. Thank you, Catherine, because you get to like give a shout out to everybody who saved their life. Um, uh, well, right now I'm working with a wonderful Palestinian director, um, Sam Rose Saber, and uh, we're doing a comedy of mine at Stanford. And we kind of have a big deal Egyptian movie star in our play, which is like, making all the old people in my community think I'm actually a celebrity, which is hilarious. Um, but he's, um, so, you know, I feel like I've worked with some of the best living directors working today. My first show uh, was Chocolate and Heat and Sam Gold directed it and it was one of his first shows. Um, and I worked with the wonderful Marion McClinton um, who, who did all the August Wilson stuff um, in his later years or not all, but a significant amount of his Broadway premieres. And, and I feel like I just owe those, those men so much in terms of just, you know, believing in my voice and my work. Um, I do want to circle back a little bit to just identity real quick, but I, and just say that I actually, in, I had to, I felt like I had to hide my Palestinianness to be in American theater. Um, the three years I was, you know, paying to be a graduate student in playwriting, um, I hid all my plays about Arabs and Arab Americans and Palestinians. And I wrote like, you know, big campy Egyptian female pharaoh plays. And, and that's what I showed the world. So I, I feel like one of the things I want to bring into this space is the fact that I felt it was dangerous to my career as an artist to be who I was. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I really have no potential to be any sort of artist unless I engage with the things that really matter to me. And so 
uh, you know, working with Samer at this stage in my life on this play um, at Stanford has been really, really transformative to me because if you had told me at 21 that, that the world would change enough for me to work with somebody at that level who was from my background, um, I never would have believed it. Thank you for saying that, Betty. That's amazing. And I, I would like to hear from anybody else, too, um, on the subject of what you encountered in terms of um, feeling that you're, uh, hmm, how do I put this? Well, something like what Betty was saying that about hiding one's identity or putting it to the side or not emphasizing it. Is that something that you, the rest of you have encountered in yourselves or in your work? I haven't encountered it about my identity. Um, that is something that I think falls to Palestinian Americans in a way that, you know, really doesn't, mm -hmm. or perhaps others from the Middle East. I've encountered it with content um, in overt and not overt ways. And I kind of finally just decided that, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What would you write if you didn't, if you weren't worried about that kind of thing? And mm -hmm. um, so, so I have a play Unseen and, and it used to have just, uh, generic on purpose locations throughout the Middle East. I was like, I'm not going to identify where. I also, at that point, wasn't interested in saying that a scene was in Homs or something and then having an audience go, oh God, that's Syria, so awful there, and, and go that path. So, but I finally came around to, you know, this scene really feels like Gaza to me. So I'm just going to put that. And if somebody reading this play says, they're not gonna have a scene that takes place in Gaza where a schoolhouse has been bombed out, then that's their choice. So uh, I would just say that in terms of, in terms mm -hmm. of that. It, and it isn't, I think we probably know about things where it is overt and Betty, I think what you experienced was uh, overt and covert all at once regarding your identity. I don't wanna speak to it, but uh, I would like to get into a climate where we can just fucking be honest you know what I mean? But theaters don't want to do that. <laughs> no one wants to say, well, we can't do this play because- And subtle. You know, no, just and, and subtle, honest and So you're, t you're, you're saying that you are encountering in terms of um, theaters across the United States, uh, a kind of what? How would you characterize the response? I can't, again, it's, it, I can't speak to something that's like this one thing happens. I think part of, for me anyway, what, what Heather was describing about, I was really struck Heather when you said, well, by then we'd already had one war with Iraq. And, and here you are doing, by the way, an amazing, nine month run is amazing. And people didn't know what was going on perhaps in that moment. And I think as somebody who's half American and, and half Lebanese, um, I, I think all of us in this room have had moments when we're like, do people really not know? Like when I was little, I remember knowing who Sadat and Begin and all these people were. And you know, the Lebanese civil war was sort of in our house every day, what was happening over there. And so for me, that's a little my secret mission is to make it that, you know, the myopia that, that, that we have as Americans, I mean, a lot of people don't want to know what's happening two towns over, but my hope is to always make it like, no, no, you are, we're all part of this world cycle, you know, and, and so I would say that it's, it's partly that people go, oh, it's political. Oh God, nobody really, people want to relax. And it's like, uh, I, I, I share a, an apartment with the lovely Naila El Etresh, who, should have a panel all her own. And she was talking about politics in the Middle East. And she's like, we have it at breakfast. We have it at lunch. We have it in the bed. That is vital, I think. It's a vital way of thinking about what politics are. Because I think when people say, oh, I don't know, it's really political. What is that really saying to, to you? Um, and, and I think as, as a sports fan, I often say people will spend years evaluating why a baseball manager brought a certain closer in 
and they will talk about all the things that could have happened. That's complicated. But people will go, oh, I just, I can't, I can't take that stuff in. It's really complicated. It's not sometimes. So I guess that's where I live with all that. And in a way, I would rather somebody say, look, I'm not going to do that play because it says Gaza. I would rather that than a different type of response. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what about um, everybody else um, running into, even now in your careers, uh, running into um, responses to your work that are um, coded, uh, you know, resistance based on who knows what, you know, a, a discomfort. Sometimes when I hear people say, well, you know, it's very political and I don't know if I want to, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a discomfort in, in the reaction as though controversy um, is, is not, doesn't belong in the theater. Talk about controversy. Talk about the, your work um, as you see it and as it has been encountered um, uh, on, the, on the topic of controversy or, um, yeah, controversy. I think that's, I keep coming back to that. Sanaf, can you talk about that? Uh, I actually don't know that I can. I mean, I haven't been produced yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can say like, yeah, I can, I can speak to like a, how uh, I feel there's like just a discomfort sometimes even within the Iranian community of like, that's the only controversy I can really speak to is like mm -hmm. a, a critique I feel on how, uh, because there is, you know, not a lot of representation of Iranians, let alone Iranian women, like how I should be writing us. And so I guess I, um, I'm a little petulant about it. I, at this point, I'm like, why do, I would like to just treat myself like white artists treat themselves, which is like, let me just write whatever I feel like writing. <laughs> so I try to be really, um, I love conversations in art about responsibility. And I agree, like there's has to be responsibility in our work and often responsibility enriches the work. And yet I have to be honest that sometimes I'm like, why don't I just write jokes that I want to write and not worry about representation? Why don't I just, what, what, what would happen to my art if I was fully self-indulgent <laughs> and didn't feel like this eye on me all the time by like people in my community and people outside my community? So I don't know that I can speak to controversy. Um, not yet, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that you're at different points in your careers, in your playwriting careers, and and you having said that you haven't been produced yet, and yet you have two productions coming up in one season, which is terribly exciting. And um, you know, no doubt there there will be some conversations that happen along the way. But um, you know, I'm thinking about, for example, the topics that Heather, you've been addressing in your work, and not only with Nura, but with Fallujah, and with, I mean, not only with Nine Parts, but with Nura and Fallujah, and addressing other issues um, in Nura, uh, uh, you know, a very um, much inspired by a doll's house, and, and Fallujah addressing something very real uh, that is happening to U.S. Americans um, as a result of participation in the Iraq war. Can you talk about the responses to that? And was there a, a broad, um, what's the word, you know, diversity of responses to those, those stories that you told with the opera? Yeah, I, I mean, I can say that I've kind of known nothing but controversy on one hand, and then nothing but kind of the most honest of audience conversations on the other which is really thrilling. So the controversy is, is the unproducibility until the zeitgeist moves, right? So like to be, like nine parts was literally, I couldn't get a reading. I'm not talking a public reading. I'm talking a, can I come to your theater and read it in a back room and get some feedback? 
unanimously rejected at every turn at every front, right? Like this is how dicey it was to say anything about the Iraq war during or on the eve of the Iraq war and even after. So like the, the fact that I had to go overseas to do it and then even then I couldn't, you know, like it was just like, no, 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 until I did finally get one reading. And then it was really it was still unanimously rejected until one producer. Anyway, so these like you get these you get these one shots, you know, you get these hundreds of no's for this one shot. And then the one shot kind of cracks something. And then the conversations that come are wild. Just. I mean, I'm sure you, you're, I see you're all nodding your heads. I, I find it just extraordinary. I find it extraordinary that I could be in conversation during that war with Republicans as well as Democrats, right? With people from all sides of different issues. Um, so I've kind of, like with Fallujah, it was just like the, the war was still a good idea until 2016. Literally. Like we can't, we almost forget, but until the, until the public zeitgeist, or at least the military zeitgeist moved toward, oh, well, that war wasn't such a good idea. The opera couldn't get produced. And I find, I mean, I personally just find that a bit problematic for artists. <laughs> Trying to write about the thing in the moment that it's happening, right? and not being able to have that conversation with the public until, until the needle moves and makes it kind of a little bit safer. And I don't know that artistry needs to be safe. So. I, I wanna just yeah, jump in there. Please. I think I totally agree. I think that the safe thing, right? What, what do we mean when we say that? Um, uh, I wanted to just, because I don't know that we answered, Catherine, your, your question about uh, the, the places or people who uh, helped. And I, and I will say one of them just stepped in the room and it's Evren and, and um, anyone who's worked with Evren knows just how fucking smart he is. And um, like, I don't want to speak for Evren, but you know, he'll say, I was an engineer, I'm an engineer brain, and I, and, and yet he's an artist, so he has, like, very many ways of seeing a piece of work. Um, I think, um, for me, it, it comes down to, like, dramaturgs that I've worked with a lot of the time. Uh, Jesse Alec at The Public. Uh, it's funny, because Sanaz and I met when she was a kind of cultural consultant on a play, and there is something that the more of us that can be in those rooms at those junctures, I just think the better our work will be because, mm -hmm. you know, that was a, that was a workshop that Evren directed. And then we had Sanaz and it was like, Oh, she'll weigh in on this, you know, this character. Um, so I think, and I guess because I've worked with, certain actors quite a lot, like Hattie Tabal, Tala Ash, you know, I learned so much from them. And you know, you fight, if you've been in a, if you've been working on a piece long enough, you get into these like fights because you might make a change and they're like, what? Um, and I think what, the thing I wanna throw in as well, these are very, sorry, these thoughts are all over the place, but I think for so long, when an actor from our community was in a show, they were serving as actor, dramaturg, cultural consultant. <laughs> and I think that that's shifting and that makes me happy. I mean, it's not there yet, but oftentimes they were tasked to be the one who could explain the 1967 war to everybody else. And I think whenever we can, you know, we bring people into these rooms and say, oh no, you, you have to have Halabaki here. I think Hal is doing a panel later today, or you, you know, you have to have that voice. I need that voice because sometimes when you're Heather, I don't know how it was, be curious to know, like when you pass the baton to other actresses, you know, to embody nine parts of desire, 
you know, was there a huge dramaturgical packet or was it like, listen, how, how did you, you knew all that stuff or you, you learned all that stuff. Anyway, those are the things that are swirling around for me, I think. And Catherine, you, you've been somebody who's really pushed us forward, even just this panel or the Arabic theater festival in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, it's not like I could have put that together. I can't like get a translator and get a great reading in front of people. And you know, you've got this like, you're a little like in, in Lebanon, they call them the Zaim, but you're, I guess it's a Zaima. You're like the Zaima a little bit. And just like, how does she wait? What, you know, it's all above board, but she got a lot of shit going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> my cousins will be so glad that you used that term. Um, let me just uh, come back to Betty and, and everybody. You know, I just, this is becoming exactly what I had hoped, which is a round table. Okay. Y'all are just taking charge of this conversation. And I just dig that. I really do. And what I, I would love to hear about um, too, Betty, you were mentioning the director you're working with. And I'm, I'm just wondering over the years, it seems as though the rooms are getting fuller and fuller of people from the community and people who really understand what the play is about. Am I right about that? And can you talk a little bit about that, about the rooms that you're in? Betty, any thoughts about that? Well, I think, you know, for me, it's not, it's, there's, a, there's the rooms you wanna be in and the rooms you're in, you know? And I, I love that you mentioned Evren, um, Mona, because uh, I, I, I'm delighted when, when Evren's career started to take the ascent that I, that we all saw. And now he's, you know, a seminal figure helping develop this work. You know, I knew Evren when I worked at the Magic and I, I don't like to age myself, but a long time ago. And I was like, how is this Turkish kid who graduated from Princeton not getting the kinds of uh, directing opportunities? It like flabbergasted me that, that um, the San Francisco community was not, you know, embracing this talent. Uh, and, uh, you know, so when I see things like now he's at Oregon Shakespeare, I feel like the the room, you know, that we've always been there. We just haven't been in those rooms. And, you know, for me, one of the things that's really important to me is, is I am an artist and I, you know, my, the play that I'm working on with classical theater of Harlem is a, a sequel to Shakespeare's um, Twelfth Night. It's called Malvolio. And I feel like, one of the things that was nice about having somebody who was not from our community being a director like Sam Gold is people were like, she actually can write to him. They would say things that, because the assumption was that I was somebody who with all the pedigree that I had and worked really hard to get was somebody who was not really an artist on the par with other white artists. And so the fact that I deal with form and, and almost every play I create is a new play like this play, I read all of Neil Simon to write this comedy that we're doing. You know, I'm very, very much committed to the form. I work my butt off to be the best artist I can be, to develop my own craft and to learn with each new play, which is why every play I do is wildly different. Because I'm like, let me deal with the Shakespearean comedy. Let me deal with a Neil Simon comedy. And I, so, so, so the fact that we, I, I feel like what's exciting is that we are now in those rooms. Um, and able to pull other people uh, and, and showcase our artistry, uh, which is um, really, really exciting. Um, I, I kind of made a pivot in my career and I wrote about it um, in HowlRound, so hi HowlRound people who are listening, uh, but about really investing, you know, when I got out, you wanted to be produced off Broadway in the fancy places. And, you know, I had that kind of career very early on and I realized that it was going to keep me in the box of writing Roar every three years. And I needed to expand. And the only places that were willing to do that were places like Classical Theater in Harlem or places where there's a professor who is actually Palestinian on staff. Um, so I think that one of the things that, that is so nice about the multiplicity of voices is that we're actually artists. You know, we're actually contributing to the art of this culture and this country. 
And that gets lost sometimes. And the more we have people like Everin in positions of relative power, the more we can um, really showcase that we are, you know, the next Neil Simon or the next Arthur Miller instead of, you know, just, uh, you know, a diversity pick, you know, so it was really nice to have that kind of lens of a, of a white man getting the feedback he was getting on a play like the black eyed, you know, which is, uh, takes influences from Ntozake Shange, but also from Samuel Beckett, you know, so, and, and the kind of the honesty they, they had with, it's actually a play and it might be a good one, you know, was, was something that I, working with it with just other Middle Eastern artists, you wouldn't get that level of honesty about how we are pigeonholed and seen within a season and within, uh, you know, the predominantly white American institutions that we are all fighting and struggling and uh, sweating to get a spot at, so. Oh, Betty, thank you for saying all that. That's amazing, really. And talking about the multiplicity, that's that's so important. Anybody want to talk about the rooms again a little bit more? The rooms that you've been in, the room you want to be in, um, you know, moving forward now having, you know, certain experiences behind you, talking about, you know, people you want to have in the room with you, people um, you would like to have in the room with you, um, talking about the, the, the strength of being surrounded by um, people from the community who understand what you're talking about and and it, it, this is the other for them, but then also working with people who don't come from what you come from and actually finding a way to each other. Can you talk about that at all? Heather, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I can, I mean, yes. And I wanna just uplift uh, my collaborators at Georgetown University, but it, it leads to this conversation completely. So the, um, Derek Goldman and Maya Roth at Georgetown have just saved my life and saved my career. Um, and hugely because they, they work in a way that I like to work, which is hugely process oriented, but let me come in with questions and dig around in communities that were both similar to mine and completely opposite to mine. And I like to fire my plays in both environments. So I want a bunch of Arabs <laughs> looking at it, talking about it, right? And then I want people in Kansas City to do the same, right? So I'm, it's really, I'm kind of working those polls, but I'll say that like, when it comes to rooms, I mean, I, I agree with Betty. There's a, there's a, I agree with Betty that this might be, but this might be in the past. I have real hope that this is in the past. So the room was like with nine parts, it went, it went to a bunch of different rooms, let's say, right? Super lucky, super lucky, right? But nothing came of that. It was 17 years before I was able to do another play and I wasn't commissioned by the American theater. So without Georgetown, I literally, and especially cause you know, I had two kids in the middle of that. I was like, I wouldn't have had a career. Like literally, it was fundamentally, I tell Derek and Maya that every time I see them practically, it's just like without you saying, come work on something, come do something, Nora would never have happened. Fallujah wouldn't, I mean, Fallujah, you know, wasn't an American theater project, it was Canadian, but I even went to them to develop it, right? So these, these, these places where we have friends and collaborators matter so much to keep you afloat during, during some really hard and dark time, you know, during times where you are pigeonholed or you, you, you can't make the next opportunity happen. So, so yeah, as a, as, but what I'm excited about now is that for the first time in my entire life, we have three writers from our community in my environment here in New York, right? In this off-Broadway, we have Sanaz and Mona and Sylvia. And then in one theater, we have two. We have Sanaz and Sylvia in the same season. And this has not happened, right? This has not happened. If we say this movement, let's call it, is 20 years old, 
this is the moment that this has finally happened. Yeah, so, I want to just add to it. Sorry, Heather. I just wanted to add really quickly that when this is like maybe embarrassing to say, but I remember when Sylvia's play was announced and her play is amazing. Shout out, everyone go see it. Go see Selling Cobble at Playwrights Horizons. Um, when it was announced, you know, pre-pandemic, I was like, oh, so like that, I'll be maybe another year I can be, I can fill another Middle Eastern slot. So I think it's really saying something that like two Middle Eastern artists in, in this, in the, that season, I want to like, it really means something. I think it like, we're in this moment now, like that it almost angers me a little bit that it took like, in many ways, I'm like, it feels like it took Trump's travel ban for people to believe us that like <laughs> there was a lack of representation and like that Islamophobia and I'm just sort of like applying that very widely to Middle Eastern people. Like, I don't know, I, I, I felt like before that I have felt gaslit a lot of the time by the American theater in a way where I'm like, these things that affect my life so profoundly no one else really seemed to be concerned with. Um, so I think it's a really, really exciting moment as well. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, uh, Sinaz, and, and, and even the topic of representation, because I really want to, I want to open that up a little bit. And um, Heather will bear me out on this, too, that it wasn't just the travel ban, and it wasn't just that, oh, the time has come. There have been a lot of bumps along the way. And there was a particular um, controversy at Playwrights Horizons a few years ago that we encountered, that we were in broad discussion about um, a play that actually Heather was in the cast of. And um, it made pe people speak up about their feelings about representation. And lo and behold, someone was listening and people were listening. And Adam Greenfield, gotta lift him up because you know he was paying attention. And, um, and not only he, but other people. And this is what happens, I think, I could be wrong, and I want y'all to speak about this because you know more than I do, but it does seem like when one person starts sitting up and paying attention and taking action, then other people start to do it too. Any thoughts about that? No I thoughts just, about that. I, I mean, it was a long time coming that yes. these plays needed to be in these seasons. I mean, I just wanna I wanna say on behalf of Mona, like the public developed <laughs> her play. And how long did it take for them to do it? Right? Like I, yes, yes, they're doing it. But like, come on. Just that, I don't know, <laughs> 17 years between projects and in the middle of that time, the Middle East was like we, nothing, nothing was simple. P, I don't know that people were noticed. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's just a reaction to like what was made of what happened in the profane. Oslo was happening down the street and nobody said anything. Right? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, I, I don't know what kind of discussions were happening. I think that, I think that I do want to just love on this moment <laughs> because there are, the, this is a collective moment for these women that is, that we've all got to feel so good about that none, not one of them is alone in this season. And it's across New York and may it, may it go forth across the nation. Muna, anything? Muna, are you there? She might, 
she might be frozen. Well, gee, I'm glad I brought up a painful subject. Um, my strengths, actually. Um, <laughs> would you like to say anything about that, Betty? Uh, I just want to second um, what Heather said. You know, it was it was a lonely field um, out there, and uh, and what it did was it, you know, there was a real hunger for war porn and you know sexist porn. Uh, you know, because one of the things that I write about is is the intersectionality between sexism and, and Arab and American culture. That's kind of what the play that I'm working on is about, how the two different cultures work on women and commodify them in different ways. And that is not welcome in American theater. I always say this, and I believe it's true. If I wrote a play about a girl named Fatma who got killed by her father named Muhammad, that would be on Broadway. I, I fundamentally believe that if I reinforce stereotypes, um, that that would herald my career in a way that it has not been um, uh, doing the kind of work where I'm asking us to really interrogate our own culture as Americans, rather than look to the Middle East to feel better about our situation as women here, which is actually a tactic you use to um, divide. Women are 50% of this world and we're divided and we feel better about some things in our culture and worse about some things in our culture. But I try to write about, you know, and, and being Palestinian is, a, is an enormous part of my identity. I feel Palestinian and American, which is easy to do in, because of, of the diaspora and kind of that identity. I hold both of those in my body, but I'm also a woman and that has become for me, you know, uh, I'm a woman of a certain age. I'm not the same kid who came out of drama school and was getting, um, you know, the kind of visibility that the first person usually gets in a, in a, in a um, culture. So I, I applaud and I'm so excited about these women's voices, but I also feel like we, it's not just who gets to tell the stories, it's what kind of stories we're allowed to tell. And I have not found personally, um, but the stories that I want to tell most in American theater in America about Americanness are, are the ones that, that people are interested in. Um, and, uh, but I'm prolific. I'm going to write and keep writing a lot of plays and not, you know, but I fundamentally believe that, that the plays that are of mine that um, are the most complicated are the most difficult to sell in the current mm -hmm. cultural environment. And so I can only mm -hmm. speak to my own experience, but it is such a relief to not have to carry the burden of representation um, uh, because, uh, you know, we all come, we're from different races, classes, parts of the Middle East, parts of this country, and that's what we need to see. But we also need to be seen as artists, fundamentally, and Americans, and part of the fabric of the artistic development of our field, um, which is something that I'm really struggling to keep in my own like mid-career kind of struggle at the forefront, you know, um, that, that our artistry, um, as much as our identity um, is something that, that we should be allowed freedom to write a, you know, sequel to Twelfth Night and get that supported in the way that, you know, white men uh, are of a certain level are able to get um, that kind right. of support we're, we're, we're in, like engaging with our world literature is something that is is after 20 years in this game something that's really really important that 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 the people coming out of drama school now don't feel like the only kinds of works that can get produced or the, deal with these topics in these ways and simplified you know and mm -hmm. not complicated and not interrogating our own Americanness as well mm. so Oh, Betty, so, so beautifully put, really, honestly. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much for your candor. I, I'm just so grateful, honestly. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, before we open it up to questions um, from the attendees, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. And it's, it's exciting to me, for example, with the um, commissions that you've received and the and the, the work that you're doing, that you are also um, uh, at least uh, Munna and Heather and Betty um, taking your work into other media. 
and and I'm I'm very interested in that with um, uh, the commission that you have from Noor, Betty, and uh, you know Heather uh, with uh, nine parts in film and Muna writing for television. I I'm just very curious about you know the topic of adaptation in particular, but in general moving into another media with your writing and what it feels like and what's frightening about it and what's exciting about it. And um, yeah, like that. Any thoughts about that? Well, I'll jump in because I have a funny story. Please, um, please. When Roar was produced, HBO came and saw it. And at the time, the only show I felt or that was worth writing for was The Sopranos. It was, it was a whole different world, kids. It was like, like HBO and Showtime and Three Network. It was just, whoa. Um, and I had somebody who was Emmy nominated for a role in The Sopranos in my play. So I'm thinking HBO's calling me to invite me to, to be part of The Sopranos writing team, um, which is, you know, uh, and you'll find out later in the story, absolutely ridiculous because, you know, they were white, <laughs> mostly white men who had been in television for decades who were on, you know what I mean? So they sit me down and, you know, I'm in my twenties, I'm at HBO, NYC, you know, just sent my off-Broadway uh, premiere. And I'm waiting for the offer, right? And they said to me, uh, well, we liked Roar and want you to write a pilot based on Roar. And my reaction was, and I'm still kicking myself about it, no, I don't want to be pigeonholed. I want to write for The Sopranos. And they were like, thank you, goodbye. And <laughs> it took me 20 years to get a commission from Newer to do the thing. And so that's something I got to tell everybody. Never say no to anything. Just say, all right, <laughs> let me think about that. You know what I mean? Like, because, <laughs> because your expectation of, it's actually the best thing I could have done. But at the time there was no insecure. There was no Kim's convenience. I didn't see a way forward for a play in a storefront in Dearborn to be a show. So I didn't have the conception that that was actually an offer worth. I thought that that was just, you know, that you're going to throw some money at me and make my Emmy nominated star happy. You know what I mean? Like, so, so the world has changed and now uh, there is insecure, there is Kim's convenience, there is Rami, there are these things in the culture. So now I'm back to, you know, <laughs> trying to do what I said no to so foolishly in my 20s through and through well, Noor. And that's very meaningful for me because again, Noor didn't exist when I came out. It, it actually came out around the time I was being produced at New York Theatre Workshop. So it's very meaningful to me because I do tend to work with other people of color. And so the fact that I'm working with an Arab American theater company, do you know what I mean? is so deeply meaningful to me because that hasn't been the case in my career. I've been either working with uh, predominantly African-American companies or, you know, straight old white institutions. So it's deeply, deeply meaningful that Noor is giving me the opportunity to do, to say yes to something I should have said yes to a long time ago. Well, we're super excited about it, Betty. Um, and actually that is a, before I uh, tap the rest of you, uh, this is a good moment for me to just, you know, also um, acknowledge the shout outs in the chat and give my own shout outs to Noor Theater and Lamis and Maha and Nancy who started the theater and, you know, uh, Jamil in Chicago and Taranj and Sahar at Golden Thread and, you know, all of the um, companies that, you know, have devoted their uh, resources and their time and their support to uh, lifting up uh, Middle Eastern playwrights. And, um, but on the topic of adaptation and moving into other media, any thoughts about that, Heather? You having fun there? Did you, did you, was it, was yeah, it easy? No, no, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't easy because I mean, Nine Parts is a monologue solo show. So no matter without a, without a protagonist or a narrative through line. So that's like the opposite of, <laughs> film or TV, right? And and also this version was never going to be you get nine actresses on location in the Middle East, right? It was it was unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, fortunately, that's not like. But what's been thrilling is having spent nine months in Michigan during COVID, which I call my my swing state summer, right? And I'm deeply from that place. So I, I, 
I found out I had a lot to say. So when you look at a play 20 years later and you look at what's at stake when you wrote it, and then you look at what's at stake now, and you can draw an absolutely direct straight line from Iraq to Michigan, 2020, and the kinds of divisions and the kinds of polarity and the everything, every single thing. And you can even draw a straight line to, you know, where was this set? in the original play, well, it was set on the Tigris and Euphrates and what's at stake in Michigan. And how does this, you know, we're, it's set on the Flint river right now, right? Which is, it's all, it's all right there. So that kind of sense of, do I even want to pretend this is being shot in the middle East and being in this story is happening in this way, or do I want to absolutely plop it straight down in the middle of an American identity? and let the same characters say what they have to say. That's been the, that's been the thrill, is um, not thrilling because one doesn't wish for this, <laughs> for America to be in this moment, but to be able to work from the Midwest and from inside the American zeitgeist with this has been a really powerful way to consider moving medium and moving in the adaptation. Uh, I'm ever since you told me about it, I've just it's been in the back of my mind and I've been wondering how it's going and uh, all of that. I, I really it's such a thrilling way of looking at it, Heather. Just amazing. And Mona, you're, you're writing for television. You, you're working on a, a new pilot, is it too? Uh, yeah, it's it's yes. Uh, for 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 AMC. Yes, AMC International. Um, what is AMC International exactly? Well, it's. I mean, I'm not exactly sure either. But it's you know AMC <laughs> has their 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 network right, and they and and right. so it's. I think. I think. The international might just be um, works that do straddle these different countries and places and time zones. Um, but um, I think what I just won't keep thinking about is that like, it's, it's, it's about, you know, I don't know, it's gonna sound Marxist or something and that's fine, but like getting the means of the production in your own hands, right? So it's like, um, Like I don't have those means yet, but if I did, I would be like, we're gonna have a theater festival every two years, right? With like all of the writers on this Zoom, you know, instead of waiting for someone to decide that, you know, every 10 years they'll do like a Middle Eastern, a taste of the Middle East. Um, so while there's been a ton of progress, I think that's how you you can, I, I, I have those dreams. Um, I think, along those same lines, like I look at all the women on this Zoom and I'm like, we, if, if I were at this place in my career, I would be like, let's each write one episode of a short, what do you call it? A, a you know, like a Netflix. Limited like, series. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. like a limited series that's about these questions. Like, wouldn't that be amazing? Ooh. And that's not pie in the sky, that can happen. It's just, we're not quite there yet. And so it's, it is not to sound corny, but it is propping each other up. It is lifting each other up and having conversations that can be hard is part of that. But it is a sense, I feel that that is part of my mission is to be like, you know, bring just these stories, you know. Yeah, no kidding. To the yeah, forefront. it's my mission too, Mona. It's my mission too. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, Heather's in, by the way. Yeah, she's in. Yeah. No, I just, I just, I, I, I uplift that, Mona. Um, I've, I've long wanted to like just be in a writer's room with our group, right? And make that, make that program happen as a collective group. But beyond that, I agree, Mona, with just the fundamental idea that it's sort of like the Betty and you and I have have felt the decades pushing to this moment and it feels like the collectivity of it is something that's really the next phase so more than even 
great that there are multiple productions at the same time. There sort of seems like a, a collective group effort as to what the other thing is that can actually be built out of this. And in some ways, I think the moment that we're in, in addition to all these things, is that in some ways, the the most daring, the most daring narrative narratives, the most daring ways of showing narratives are happening in TV. Unfortunately, I do think American theater, which I love, and I grew up going to like the old Globe Theater and then eventually La Jolla Playhouse. And but I I personally feel that it is still like the really, really there's we're all incredible. Okay. But I'm saying like the the things where you're like, whoa, I don't know how they did that, or this show showed me this, 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 and this, those are happening more on uh cable, you know, streamers and things like that. And and I don't exactly know why. I think that there is something in American theater that is just so afraid of controversy. And as you said, Heather, why? Like if a play gets two people to um have a heated discussion, is that is isn't that kind of why? You know, it, it means something has been moved inside them. And at least in my experience, I think and I can't speak completely to this because I haven't had a million plays produced, but I think American theater by and large still is like, oh God, a couple of patrons left in intermission. I remember seeing a play at La Jolla Playhouse um, when I was in college and it was a um, Figaro gets a divorce. It was directed by, I can't think of his name, but a very like avant-garde American theater director. The audience of La Jolla audience left in droves in droves and I got my brother a ticket to see it because I could get a million people tickets to see it. And I said, yeah, you know, a lot of people are leaving. He goes, well, I said, you know, I just don't know. And he goes, well, maybe they're the ones who need to see it. And I think the model of, you know, this upset a patron, let's talk about it, right? So again, I'm not in that machine, so I can't speak to it, but I think that you see things more, I see things more edgy on HBO than I often do in the American theater. And I and I I want to just keep reminding myself of that as just an artist, that what are the what are the things that you would write if if you weren't afraid of 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 it being known? Sorry, that made no sense, but I'm having technical problems and I'm now on my phone. So I'm just like, who knows? No, that that made a lot, I thought that made a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, I think we can take, oh, sorry, um, go ahead. Sorry, did you someone say I just, something? I just wanna uplift that too, because one of the most exciting things I have seen is, you know, uh, Tanya Siracho become a showrunner and do an entirely Latino writing team. You know what I mean? You used to have Sanford and Son and there would be like almost no black people writing that show. And now you can't do that anymore. You can't have a Native American show and not have people feeling like it should be predominantly Native American writers, which, you know what I mean, I think is, is also such an exciting moment in terms of TV um, that, that, you know, if somebody is going to try, if one of us is going to try to do a show, the network is going to be like, well, where are your cohort of other Arab writers who are going to be writing with you? And I think part of the difficulty of, you know, the aloneness that I felt and um, uh, was that you're in American theater, you're seen at, you know, like for the first time, Kareem Fahmi and I were in a reading series and it was uh, at, at Theater Works Silicon Valley. It was the first time in my entire life there were two Middle Eastern writers who, and it wasn't about a Middle Eastern thing. And it wasn't kind of in reaction to, oh shoot, we really blew this. So let's get two Middle Eastern writers. You know what I mean? Which, which I feel like a little bit that knee jerk of like, let's throw, you know what I mean? Which, you know, I have benefited from because, you know, there's, there's that impulse to be like, oh, let's find that person. Let's not look like how we look, you know what I mean? You know, and so it was really meaningful to me to be in like an online reading series with another Arab where it wasn't about, they had this controversy and now they're doing us here 
or they have, you know, this, they decided that they're doing a Middle Eastern series and this is it. It was just, we were two writers in the same series. It wasn't in reaction to this kind of, uh, oh no, we really blew it. You know what I mean? Like kind of feeling mm -hmm. that I feel like, and that's why I'll keep coming back to the importance of our artistry and what we're contributing as artists, not just as Middle Eastern artists, but as, as people who are making work in this field. Um, and the insistence upon that coupled with, yes, if, we, if one of us has a TV show, they're gonna think it odd and strange that we don't work together and make that show, you know, a comprehensive, like, you know, uh, kind of community building thing in the way that Tanya Sriracha was able to do with the Latino American community and the Native American shows that are coming out or are doing. So I think that's what's nice about this cultural moment where you do have different writers, you know, in the off-Broadway scene where there's more sense of we can work together rather than, you know, we are pigeonholed and, you know what I mean? And we're given opportunities as a response to people blowing it, you know? Yeah, thank you, Betty. You know, before we open it to a few moments of questions, Sanaz, did you want to add anything or Heather? No, I, I I agree with what everyone's saying, and I'm also like, I was sent a script for TV a few months ago in which a, um, an Iranian man was praying over a rocket headed toward Tel Aviv, so I'm also very much like, and, and they were, at, uh, they wanted to hire me to like write the the Iranian people, <laughs> sorry, it's so ridiculous. So I feel like, yes, things, I, I just wanna like, uh, I do think things are getting better, but sometimes it's like the more, things are also the, the same. And I feel like I change my opinion, like kind of every hour on how I feel about that. So I don't really, I don't know, maybe it's okay. Like, yes, we can hold those two things at once, but I still, I don't know, I'm having I'm developing something with TV right now. And I'm like, I actually don't know who's, who's more risk averse, theater or TV. Like I really actually cannot tell. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I still, my heart wants to say like, we are more willing to have harder conversations in theater or those those hard conversations are more effective because like it's rude to get up out of your seat like I just can't really tell <laughs> but um yeah that's really all I I have oh, I hear you so much I hear you totally yes Heather anything you want to say about that before we open it up Off subject, but not. Um, I'm really interested in the Shahrazad squad um, because I've been, as some of you know, I've been talking about what are the systems of care and how do we come together? So back to this, how do we come to, what are we working on together as opposed to working on individually? And due to decades of exhaustion and loneliness and you know all these things mm -hmm. that I'll you know I'm mm -hmm. pretty open admitting to um it's this idea that our community that there's you know women in our community that have created an environment that's built on care mm -hmm. and care for each other and the needs of the care systems I'm really excited by I'm just super excited yeah. by how we address it and talk about it. And I know that, and I'll say this because this is a Monotma gathering, but like in gatherings in the past, when we're doing these things so often we get asked, can you, not this panel, nothing like that. Just like, can you come give of yourself in these ways? And when some of us are just so exhausted to the bone in all the ways we've given and given and given, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, but can we have one place where we're, where we're drinking in a workshop where, <laughs> as opposed to always leading it, can we take it or can we 
you know, mm -hmm. do something for each other. And I think that I really want to advocate for that being said and being continued to be part of conferences and how how we arrive to something not with just what we can offer but how we can fill up right because I think yeah. a lot of I'll just you know a lot of us artists have been out it, it's been ex, it, it's been exhausting carrying what we've been carrying mm -hmm. and um I'm interested yeah I'm interested in how how this post 2020 environment acknowledges that and goes forward in these really different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'd like to see if anybody um, has any questions for the for the speakers and uh, and but while people are considering that um, it would be wonderful um, Leila or whoever is involved with Shehrazad squad if you could put something in the chat that um, we could link to um, and, uh, and and get more information about what you're doing. That would be great. But in the meanwhile, um, I wonder if anybody who is, thank you, Leila, uh, attending can, um, do you have any questions? And you have an option, You could uh, two options. You could put the question in the chat or you could um, uh, turn on your video, which you are enabled to do and uh, raise, your, raise your hand, that little yellow hand, whatever you like. Aha, here's a question from Zaina. Um, what empowers your creative audacity? What is it that supports you in feeling most grounded, confident, or confident in your vision or voice on a project? Interesting. Um, that's a great question. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, long live the lark. Uh, my, I'm speaking this because um, I think, uh, what grounds me is often working with collaborators, working with actors and a director and saying, you know, I, I think I'm fairly comfortable with the question of like, I don't know what the fuck this is about. I don't know what the fuck this is gonna be yet. Um, those places, obviously a lot of institutions will offer, you know, workshops, but an institution is different. When you go to an institution to do that sort of thing, you can't help but think, you know, I hope this leads to something. And so that is a huge loss, right? Um, but that's what grounds me and I, and I working with actors and sitting in rooms, having discussions. Um, I started a theater company a couple of years ago and we are, we loosely, loosely create work based on like the joint stock method of making theater. So interviews, conversations, whatever. And, and the joy of it to me is that uh, working in the room with actors from day one and the notion that, you know, if you're here in this room, you're going to kind of be in it. You're going to do this. Um, and that's what, anyway, that's what really grounds me is, is taking these like nascent pieces of something, sharing it in a, in a, a safe place. Sometimes you don't even need to talk about it. You're like, great, just heard it. And um, it's given me a great deal of food for thought. Wonderful. Sinaz, how about you? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I think er like in my process, I need a lot of, uh, I guess I do need some hand holding. <laughs> like I, I just need to know that like, uh, I always think about like what we would ask for if we could like what you want your play to smell like. I would just think I just lead really, lead with smell, I don't know, cause I'm Iranian and like have a big nose. Like, I don't know what that's about, but like, I feel um, like it's important to have a confidant really early in the process for me who mm -hmm. like shares all like the, who like knows all the ugly parts and the secrets I want to put in a play. And it's like, yes, do it, it's worthwhile. So I think it just like, yeah, that's that's the most I, I know. Yeah, how to yeah. Answer. Betty? Well, I'll say two things. Um, one is my life could look very different. You know, some of my family went to Kuwait and then they were thrown out of Kuwait after the first Gulf War. I could have been in Palestine in my grandfather's house in Ramallah where, you know what I mean, you have to like sometimes brave guns and military curfews to 
put on plays. So I feel an enormous and overwhelming sense of responsibility to actualize myself as an artist for all the versions of myself that might not have been here. Um, and all the women who may be more talented than I am, who are living in conditions, who are just like me in every way in terms of, you know, ethnic makeup and family background, um, who do not have the opportunities that I have. So it makes me intense. And part of uh, this stage of my career is being more gentle with myself. Um, but I think my intensity served me well because I did write a buttload of plays and I have them, but it was driven by that sense of, you know, it really could have been different for me. And it's really mm. different for people just like me. And I need to use every ounce of ability and talent and, and life force I can to make these plays matter. And the other thing is I write comedies, you know, and nobody knows that about me. <laughs> nobody knows that about me. I'm really effing funny. Um, and, uh, and you would not know that by looking at the, the plays that I write that get produced. <laughs> um, and I believe having a sense of humor about your rage um, is so important. Mm -hmm. And the thing that grounds me is when I put on a play like the one we're doing at Stanford, um, I will watch an audience laugh. Um, and that to me, you know, I do meaning moving plays about, you know, being a woman, being a Palestinian woman, being an American woman, you know, uh, but I also love making people laugh because I feel like it's the immediate feedback of, uh, you know, you cannot, there's a fleeting sense of power over someone when you make them laugh because you suddenly <laughs> recognize, oh my God, the same absurdity lives in you and me and everyone. And you've just named it. That thing we're all hiding, that thing we're all <laughs> diminishing, that thing we're all being like, I'm professional. I'm not projecting this insanity that isn't, you know, my daily mental space. So I think it's important to, to really right towards that, um, you know, and, and, and Edward Said, who is kind of, you know, I don't think I would exist at, in the same way if he hadn't made it possible for me to, you know, he was a real angry guy. And I think I'm a real angry person. And I think that helps me somehow. And I think rage is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Heather, um, do you any final words on that topic before we say goodbye for today? Um, well, quite like Betty, I have stakes. I'm always looking at the stakes, you know, what's it, if it feels like they're everywhere. Right. Um, so that's what grounds me and gives me, according to the question, the audacity, right. Is just that it, the stakes are, I've been waiting for the stakes not to be so high. When I was 20, mm -hmm. there was the first Iraq war. When I was 30, there was the second one, 9-11 was in there. You know, it's every time I think, oh, I'm going to I'm going to go write this other thing because the stakes aren't so high now. I get to do this. Right. And the stakes just keep getting higher. Um, but yep, I'm still excited to write my other things. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, before we before uh, I move on, I just want to read a, a comment in the chat that's quite lovely. As a female, this is from uh, Vana. Uh, as a female Middle Eastern actor, it is so incredibly exciting to have female Middle Eastern playwrights whose plays I can read, identify with, and work on. Thank you all for your time and for your wisdom, which I think is just a lovely, lovely final quote. Um, I just, I mean... This is, uh, my, my brain is on fire from everything you've been saying. And um, I just want to thank you all, Muna Mansour and Sanas Tusi and Heather Rappo and Betty Shamia. Um, and um, I am so looking forward to seeing Sanaz's productions and Muna's production at the Public Theater. And I mean, I've been such a friend and ally to The Vagrant for so long now. I'm just sort of ah, so invested and I cannot wait. Um, and I'm taking 35 students to see the show. Yeah, amazing, right? Um, okay, 
So um, I just hope everyone um, who's on this call uh, will be able to return for the next of today's panels, which is Academia and the Next Generation, moderated by Malik Najjar, that starts at 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and, uh, and, and that you check in on the other events throughout today and tomorrow, okay? It's uh, uh, very meaningful for us all to be together. So thank you so, so much. Um, this meeting will be ended uh, momentarily, but if you want to return for other panels you, today, you need only click on the same link that you used earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I hope everyone has a fine morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And uh, I'm to send you all my love. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine.